Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome back to a Porsche Cool podcast. This podcast is about Porsche, all things Porsche, uh, no matter what model, uh, no matter what year, no matter if it's air cooled or water cooled. It's just a Porsche chat, and I do these uh, podcasts. Well, I'm trying to do these podcasts, as I said in my last episode. I'm trying to do these podcasts twice a week. Uh, they'll come on on a Wednesday, and they'll come on a Friday, Wednesday and Friday, I think. Yeah, that's what I'm doing, Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, <clears throat> they may go back to once a week, but at the moment they're twice a week. Uh, these podcasts will come up on all the main uh, podcast platforms, Apple, Google Music, Spotify, uh, what's the other one, uh, Podbean, uh, all the podcast uh, platforms. And then it will also be uploaded to my YouTube channel, and my YouTube channel is Michael Bath, and there will be uh, there will be the podcast there as well for you to listen to. For those of you who like to prefer to listen to YouTube, and I know there's a few of my people who, a few people that follow my podcast can follow my YouTube channel that actually enjoy uh, listening to it on YouTube instead of through uh, the usual podcast platforms, which is cool, which is very cool. Um, today I thought I'd just chat. Porsche chat about a couple of things. Uh, and the first one is, and I was reading an article about this, I think, or a couple of articles, is the importance of the 991, uh, the importance of the 991 and the importance of um, the 991 in the history of the 911. Uh, we don't really see these things in the present time. We don't really see how important a certain generation of model is. And it's quite interesting, too, because a lot of the models that uh, when they come out, like Models that are, uh, are seen as being very ugly, uh, like the 996, the 964 when it came out, uh, and the 964's uh, proven everyone wrong. It was a bit of the ugly uh, 911. It wasn't really that well loved. People seem to love the 993 after it and the 911 before it. Um, but now the 964, as, as we all know, it's appreciated a lot. It's, it's expensive. Um, it's hard to get a good Carrera too. Uh, if you want to get a Carrera RS, then you've got to have a hell of a lot of money. Um, so, you know, the, the 964 has, has shown us that we either, I don't know, and I was listening to someone else's podcast and I can't think of who this was. It could have been the smoking tire and they were talking about this. No, it was actually Jeff Swart, uh, the Porsche, who does all the Porsche advertising and Porsche racer. Um, he was saying, you know, what is it? You know, these cars that were, you know, cars that we thought were ugly when they came out, all of a sudden years later, we appreciate them. Now, either we lower our standards, <laughs> do we lower our standards, or is there something that the designers knew that we didn't know and, and they designed it so that over the years, uh, the design, the true design comes out and the design is, is appreciated. And the 964 is an example of that. Uh, the 996 is happening as well, as we talked about in my last podcast. The 996, uh, people are forgetting uh, ignoring or forgetting or forgiving the the egg headlights. They're forgiving the uh, mechanical issues. They're forgiving it because at the moment the 996 is a good entry-level 911, especially in um, countries like the US and the UK where they're quite cheap. Um, and you can buy this 911 and you can call it a Project 911 if you want or a Project 996 and you can do the car up. And a lot of people on YouTube are doing that. Uh, home built by Jeff. Uh, Hoovy's Garage has got a convertible. You know, I think I've spoken about this, someone else too. Oh, um, that Porsche, that 911 guy, Lee Sibley, he's doing one. So there's a lot of people, you know, and Magnus Walker bought it. As I said, Magnus Walker bought a 996. So these cars that we thought were ugly, I appreciate over the years. Um, so it's a bit hard to understand. I don't really understand it, but it does seem to be the case with Porsche. Um, so what about the 991? Uh, the 991 is an interesting model. Uh, it's an interesting model because I don't think yet we really appreciated the 991. And I think in some ways, because it came after the 997 and because the 997.2 or the 997.1, the 997 is a very popular model. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I own a 2006 911 Carrera. But the 997 is a popular model. The 997 GT3 and the 997 GT3 RS were highly regarded, uh, were like leaders in their leaders in their class and, and raved about when they were reviewed by um, motoring journalists. So the 997 has the benefit of having a fantastic GT3 and GT3 RS. 
The 991, when it came out, as we know, the GT3, the Point One, had issues almost straight away. Engines were blowing up, engines were catching on fire. Porsche replaced the engines, but then, you know, gave everyone a 10-year warranty on the engine. So if you buy anything in the E or F ranges in the engine, the uh, GT3 engine is E, F, and G. And the F, uh, E and F are problematic, and most of them, I think, most of the E's, I think, have been replaced by the dealer. Uh, Porsche provided a new engine, was swapped out. Uh, F's, I think, some of them have got problems, and G's, I think, minimal have problems. And I think the G is a similar engine... Similar block or similar modifications to that engine to eradicate that problem as what was in the GT3 RS. The GT3 RS, I don't think, has any issues. GT3 RS was actually pretty good, but you know it took uh, a few, a couple of years for that to come out after the GT3. I think. I'm not saying that the problems with the GT3 has caused the 991 to be that unpopular. The 991 isn't unpopular. The 991 is very popular. It's just that we haven't had enough time from the 991 generation to appreciate it, and maybe. Maybe the 991 generation uh, 911 is a lot more special or a lot more uh, unique than we actually realize today. Um, and why would that be? Why would that be? Well, I guess you got to re- look at Porsche. Look at Porsche's evolution. You know, uh, as as Porsche say, what do they say? It's an evolution, not a revolution. Um, all Porsches look the same, which we know is not true. But you know, the milestone in Porsche history. Uh, 1998 uh, ended 35 years of air-cooled Porsches. Uh, 1998 was when the 996, Type 996, 911 was introduced. Um, Not only did it look different from the outside, not only did it have the controversial headlights, not only did it uh, have a new interior, which it was uh, mixed reviews on the interior. Um, It hasn't aged very well, the interior. Um, But that was the transition that Porsche did. So, you know, the transition was, you know, the main, a pretty important milestone, really, when you think about it, transition to water-cooled engines from the 993 and then to the 996. And 996 got a little bit of, you know, it wasn't as loved as much because it was, uh, it wasn't air-cooled anymore and all the purists didn't like the idea of going to a water-cooled engine. The other thing that happened, I guess the other... I guess another milestone is the turbocharging, right? So when the 991 generation came out in 2012, um, naturally aspirated, but then the 0.2 version from 2006 went to turbocharging across the lineup. So all of the 911s were turbocharged. Uh, It wasn't just limited to the turbo or the turbo S models. Uh, It was through the whole lineup. So your basic Carrera, your Carrera S, your 4S, your GTS, was all a turbocharged engine, Uh, so no longer a naturally aspirated engine. Um, And I guess that was a pretty big thing. I remember reading reviews in 2016 when it changed to the 0.2, and a lot of people weren't happy about the turbo, uh, the turbocharging. And a lot of people even today when they look at secondhand 991s, and they're they're good prices too, that's another reason to look at them, is to get the 0.1 version of the 991 uh, so you don't have the turbocharged engine. I don't know if it's such a big thing now. Um, I'm not sure. I guess they don't sound as good as the 0.1991s. But as a milestone in Porsche's evolution, that is a pretty big milestone that in 2016 for the 0.2, 991.2 or generation 2 version of the 991 uh, was turbocharging across the range. So we need, we need to look back at that and we need, to, we need to put that into perspective, I guess, because we know uh, when the 992 was launched, it was actually, well, it was actually announced that the 992 will, the 911, 992, 911 will eventually be electrified. Uh, they didn't, Porsche didn't say that they would get rid of it, of the, the petrol engines, but it said that it would have a hybrid electrified version of the 911 in the 992 range. And I guess you can see how that works. So you can see, uh, I think the design of the inside of the, the inside of the 911 and you look at the Taycan inside and you think, yeah, you can see how Porsche could actually make the 911 um, a hybrid, uh, electrified hybrid. Um, So if the 992 generation Porsche uh, is does eventually have an electric motor. It does become like the Taycan, does become this this crazy powerful 911, which is 
God knows how many, uh, what the what the figure, nought to sixty or nought to hundred k's would be. Uh, it'd be crazy based on the Taycan. I mean, it's funny when you come back to the Taycan. I was listening to um, Smoking Tire podcast, and he just had the car, I think, for a weekend uh, press car, and he drove it in LA up the canyons. And he was saying that, you know, the Turbo S or whatever it is, or the Turbo Taycan. He says it's just too powerful. He said, not only is it expensive. That's another reason, but it's so powerful. He said he would get the 4S version. He wouldn't get the turbo version because, and I guess that's what people say about Tesla, the, the 0 to 100 or the 0 to 60 miles an hour, you know, uh, trick that it does in, in, in like record time, it wears off after a while. You know what I mean? And it wears off and it's, you know, how many times can you do that? Do you really need all that much power? Are you going to use all that power, et cetera, et cetera. And when it comes down, do I want a Taycan? Do I want a Taycan that, you know, for the benefits of the electric motor, for the benefits of the power, for the benefits of, you know, new technology? Maybe I don't need the turbo. Maybe I just need a um, 4S. And I think it's it's a good it's good reasoning what he said. And also, I think in the US, it's about a, is it a hundred thousand dollars cheaper? Hundred thousand US dollars cheaper? So it's a lot cheaper. It's a hell of a lot cheaper for a um, for basically a car that's still fast enough than most things on the road. Anyway, I'm getting off the point here a little bit, but the 992 generation, so you think about the 992 generation, it's going to have an electric motor eventually, and it'll probably be in the point two, and it'll probably be the end, and when the next generation come out, we'll probably have more uh, more in the lineup. We all know that the Macan is going to be electrified. We know that's the next one to get electrification. I'm guessing the Cayenne as well. Um, it's interesting. I read something in another, I think it was on Porsche Newsroom, <clears throat> that Porsche North America, the CEO of Porsche North America, said that by 2025, 50% of the Porsche lineup will be electrified. It'll either be a plug-in hybrid or a battery electric vehicle. Now, that's, that's pretty, that's a lot. And that's in a very short period of time. When you're thinking in the next five years, 50% of Porsche's range will be electric, electrified. Um, so that's, that's a big announcement. Uh, that's obviously what they're planning now. Uh, I don't think he'd say it if it wasn't already planning because these things take time. So you think about that. So we go back to the 991 and we go back to what I was talking about, about the milestones in the evolution of the 911 and how important the 991 generation could be in years to come and we're not really seeing it now, right? So you think about that and you think, you know, the 991 could be the last 911 without any form of electrification. The 991 will be the last non-hybrid, non-electrified 911. So, you know, when we think about milestones and we think about value and we think about collectability with Porsche and the nuances that people want to collect and the reason why people want to collect certain models and which models are the ones to collect... The 991 is an attractive 911. The 991, I still think, is a, has a nice interior. I like its interior. It looked busier when it first came out. When you see it now, it's a very simplified interior, but it has got a lot of style to it. I like the design cues in the interior. I like the uh, console. I like a lot of things about the 991. So you think about that, it's attractive. It's attractive from the outside. It's attractive from the inside. It's the last 991 before any form of electrification. You know, so that really could make the 991 generation, 911, very special in years to come. Maybe we only need to see it in five years' time once Porsche actually uh, achieve this 50% of electrification or plug-in hybrid battery electric vehicles that they're doing. So maybe then we'll see and we'll realize. But, <clears throat> you know, the 901, I think, is it's a, it's a pretty important milestone. It goes there with being a – you know, it goes there with like with the 996 transitioning from the 993 – Air to water, you know, the turbocharging lineup is another one, like I said, and then this one being the 991 being the last form of uh, 911 without any form of electrification. And the fact is the 991 is an attractive looking 911. It is an attractive looking 911, has a nice front, has nice uh, lights. You know, the DNA of Porsche is there. It's not an ugly 911. I don't think anyone's ever called it ugly. And I think, you know, we'll just... The 991 will just appreciate, and I think the 991 will become quite a collectible 911 in in the years to come. So the other thing I just wanted to talk about today is, is and this happens with Mercedes-Benz and it happens with all the brands, but all the car brands, but um, 
I guess it's the trickle down effect, isn't it? The trickle down effect of of what's been introduced in a new version, a new model. Um, and I was reading this on Porsche Newsroom as well. Um, you know the the benefits that the the 2021 Porsche 911, the 992 generation Porsche 911, is going to get from what they've introduced in the Turbo S uh, that's just been launched by Porsche. You know, and Porsche always offer. Uh, Porsche always, you know, they always have an opportunity to offer customer more options on the 911 range for each year, for each model year. Um, we all know there's a 0.2 generation that eventually comes in halfway through the, the life cycle of the 911, but it doesn't mean they don't give you extra things or extra options you can select uh, after the first year of um, it being launched or in the second year of it being launched. And that's what Porsche's done now. And it's pretty much because of the Turbo S, I think. Uh, is why, but that's based on the article that I was reading on Porsche Newsroom. Um, they've introduced, for example, the new color option, which is that Python green, which I think they used in a GTS Cayman and Boxster launch. So there's a new color for those of you who like green. But the interesting one that I thought was quite quite a good one, actually, is the front end lift feature that they're doing. Uh, the front end lift feature is a system that they've worked, that they've obviously been working on to improve. Uh, older pe- people that have GT3s will know you just press a button, it comes up, goes down. Very simple. The new one that they've done is a GPS-based memory system. So it actually remembers locations where your car bottoms out and then will automatically raise the front, front axle based on that memory. Uh, I think they call it smart lift, but I, I've been reading about it and it sounds very, very cool, especially for people that have, you know, 911s that are low. I mean, you can get this. You can get this option on a basic Carrera if you want to. Um, <clears throat> so it uses GPS data, uh, and it also has, you know, it also has a memory. Then they've done this other thing called InnoDrive, like an adaptive. It's, it's a new adaptive cruise control system, and it can predictively alter driving speed by looking up to 1.8 miles ahead via GPS data. So it's only on the PDK cars and it automatically slows down for corners or downshifts for an uphill climb. So it, it has memory. I guess all these things they're introducing, which have been introduced for the Turbo S and now available throughout the 911 Carrera models, it all, it all seems to start, especially the uh, GPS-based memory lift system, it's all kind of going towards that electrification of the 911, I think. I think that's where it's heading to. So it kind of ties in with my first part of this podcast where I was talking about the 991 and the importance of the 991. All these features are kind of leading to the 992 being quite revolutionary, even though Porsche likes to call it an evolution. It's quite revolutionary where it is going into a completely new generation, a new, a new realm. Um, and then uh, the, other, the other options you can get, which the Turbo S has, and you can get them on the, <coughs> the Carrera and the Carrera S, et cetera, uh, is lightweight noise insulating glazing, which is a good idea, available on all the models, all the coupe models, uh, which reduces the noise inside the cabin. Um, what else have they given? They're given a new light design package, which you can change colors, nothing that important. They also have a... In the uh, actually outside the US, for some reason, the article that I was reading, and I think it, I don't know whether it was on Porsche Newsroom or this was on one of the motoring uh, websites, that the um, seven speed manual is a no cost option on a 2021 Porsche 911 Carrera S or 4S. Not available on the base, it's only available on the Carrera S or the 4S. Uh, with, the small, with the Sport Chrono package, the manual is only available outside the US. It's not available in the US. Um, So I'm not quite sure. Maybe the US market doesn't, the take up of the manual was very low. Uh, I know Nick Murray on YouTube is going to be upset because he just reviewed one, which I find really weird that this article is saying that it's not available um, in the US, the manual transmission. If anyone knows that's incorrect, let me know in the comments of this podcast, but it seems a bit strange. Um, They've also offered the original, the leather package, which uh, was available in the 911 Turbo S. Uh, The original 911 Turbo is leather package. Um, So it's leather upholstery inspired by the classic Porsche quilted seats and door panels. So it's a new leather upholstery option. But I think it's really cool. I think it's really cool that Porsche is giving you the benefits. They're trickling down these benefits from from the higher Turbo S model. We all know the Turbo S is quite expensive. 
Um, so you can get more options on your base Carrera or Carrera S. Um, shame about the manual option saying it's not available in the US, which is really bad. Uh, I really like the idea of the uh, GPS lift system. Um, if I bought a uh, GT3, those of you who know me know that I want a GT3, a 997 or a 997.2 GT3 or even a 991.2 GT3, you would have to get the lift kit. Some people say you have to get the lift kit uh, on the GTS as well because the GTS is quite low as well. Uh, my, nine, my 2006 911 Carrera scrapes, uh, but it is lowered, so, but it actually scrapes when I go out of the driveway of my garage. Um, but I think that's about it for the podcast today. Uh, just a bit of a Porsche chat, a bit of a Porsche update. Um, do you think the uh, 911, 991, 911 is going to be seen as unique in the next five years? Or do you just see it as not that important of a model? Um, that's the question, I guess. That's the question that we can talk about in the comments of this podcast. Anyway, my name is Michael Barth. This is another Porsche Cool podcast. Uh, like I said, these episodes will come up every Wednesday and Friday. You can listen to them on all the major Porsche plat on all the major Porsche on all the major podcast platforms: Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, Google Music, Podbean, etc., etc. Uh, thanks for all the support. Thanks for listening. And that's it for today's Porsche Cool podcast. Bye for now.